Okay, so welcome everybody to this week's call. Uh, my name is Jackie Boyle and I live in Australia and I have the pleasure always of being able to introduce Dr. Joseph Aaron's uh, dual nominated Nobel Prize scientist and the formula, the scientist behind Emulin and so uh, 24 seven. And today we are going to be speaking about diving deeper into sleep. Uh, we had a call last week, but this week we're going to just talk about it um, in a few different aspects and Dr. Ahrens is going to take us through that. So, but firstly, how are you, Dr. Ahrens? Well, I'm good because I had such a great night's sleep, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm doing really good. Thank you. So today's call, Dr. Ahrens, like we spoke about it a little bit earlier and, and whilst we spoke about three key elements and I know you're going to base on that from last week's call but then we're going to go a little bit further into different aspects of sleep and things that we can t do to potentially enhance a better quality sleep. Yeah I sure would like to talk more about that because it's not a subject you could just cover in 20-25 minutes and uh, well you know everyone knows me I can talk from hours about nothing but sleep is very important. And uh, certainly I've noticed that in my own life. I've known it, of course, biologists, but personally, wow, things happen in your life. You really need to get some sleep. And, you know, we, this, uh, this whole area here that we're doing, this Zoom and all of our related sites are about better health. It's, we're not just trying to promote certain supplements. We really want this to be a place where people can come to get really good information. And so, we thought we would set out the building blocks and that basically just follow me through a daily routine and tell you what I know. I certainly, uh, I have own personal opinions, but most everything I tell you is really based on science, physiology, well-known accepted concepts, but they're not often understood, especially you get into the chemical balances, imbalances in your life. You hear about serotonin, melatonin, and um, tryptophan, people get really confused. And uh, should they take serotonin, melatonin, whatever? So they were here to dispel all the myths, put down the science. And I want to start by reminding you of a couple of uh, key points that we made uh, last week. And that is, Hey, it's about your diet. <laughs> you need a good diet I and mean, everything you do, whether it's weight loss or, you know, exercise, increased muscle mass, mobility, uh, mental health, uh, all of the different things that could play you, different diseases and even common things that we don't even consider diseases like colds and influenza. You really need a good night's sleep. Of course, the obvious is that your body needs energy to perform. And that's kind of a strange statement. You say, well, our body needs energy, but it's a very complex chemical process. And sleep, the chemicals that are released in sleep actually help regulate that process. And so they work together, you know, the energy management in your body and the sleep, they go hand in hand. And you, so let's just keep it simple like that. Remember, you need to sleep because you need energy. Secondly, you need sleep because it helps for you to process a lot of the foods that you have taken into your body. And it also helps you process a lot of your thoughts and memories and mental energy that you accumulated through the day. Sleep is very necessary. And when you don't do that, you end up releasing stress hormones that just further aggravate the situation. Speaking of processing your foods and diet, diet relates to sleep also. I told you that there are certain foods that promote sleep. Uh, tryptophan is one of them, tryptophan. And that is uh, uh, the precursor, the chemical that is turns into serotonin. Serotonin, is the awake and feel good chemical in your body, natural chemical. You know, we often say chemicals and everybody gets all nervous. Oh, I don't like chemicals. Hey, every piece of you is a chemical. And the chemical, the natural molecules in your body, uh, 
thousands of tens of thousands of them. Serotonin is the one that keeps you alert and it does two things. It keeps you alert and ultimately produces those feel good chemicals, dopamine, but it also ends up turning into melatonin and melatonin is the sleep chemical, the one that causes you to sleep deeply and have REM, rapid, rapid eye movement. That's when you think, wow, I got a deep sleep. That's really what people are talking about, REM sleep. So we have serotonin. It's the one that wakes you up and makes you feel good. Wow, it's a great day to be alive. It eventually turns into melatonin and melatonin increases as it gets dark and dark and dark till it's at a peak for most people, one or two o'clock in the morning. And then when sunlight comes on, it destroys melatonin and the sunlight causes serotonin to begin. So it's all controlled by light and the gland in the base of your brain. So you hit with this light, white light, blue, white light. That's the key, blue, white light. That's around 400 nanometers for people that really want to be specific, 400 to 450 nanometers. That's the color of light blue. And you have light blue, white light. That's the best light for waking you up, producing serotonin. And that eventually, as you get through the day, serotonin also causes you to want to go to sleep. Basically, you get so much energy, it causes sleep pressure telling you, okay, get ready to sleep. We've had a great day. We've worked hard, feeling pretty good. Even if you feel bad, the serotonin is saying, okay, it's been great. We're getting ready to sleep. And it's slowly waiting for mel itself to turn into melatonin. And as the darkness comes across, melatonin, it comes from serotonin. Serotonin turns right into melatonin. That's the one that calms you down, sends you into deep REM sleep. Maximum is around one or two in the morning. You sleep well, and then in the when you bright daylight happens in the morning, boom, goes back. That's the whole cycle. Remember that one. So if you want to try any serotonin or a melatonin supplements, the serotonin that you might take is in the morning, and the melatonin should be at the night. But tryptophan is a natural source of a chemical that turns into serotonin naturally. And that's where you are with your diet. So where you? you need to have tryptophan in your system. Where do you get it from? Remember, fish like salmon, great source. Eggs, dairy products. Yeah, some of you don't like dairy products. It's fine. Eat dark green leafy vegetables like spinach. Dark green is the key here. They have serotonin. So all fish, and it's not just for omega fatty acids, omega-3 fatty acids, but fish cause, has a lot of tryptophan in it. And then that turns into serotonin. Poultry, particularly turkey. If you like turkey, eat it up. It has tryptophan. So you need to have tryptophan in your body so it can be available to turn into serotonin triggered by light. Okay, I'm going to give a test at the end of this. Has everybody got that? <laughs> tryptophan turns into serotonin, turns into melatonin. Serotonin is the daytime and the nighttime is the melatonin. And that's the, the third point that I made to you is that you need to get rid of all these blue lights in your house. I'm telling you, each one of them by themselves, including the blue screen on your computer, the ones on the television, look around your house, all these electronic gizmos, they all got a little blue light. For some reason, um, the industry decided a couple of decades ago that instead of a little red light, we need to have a little blue light. So I go into my room, my air conditioner and my my uh, iPhone charger and the the uh, <coughs> little uh, little tiny little music amplifier I got in there. These are all got these little blue lights on. Even my doggone electric toothbrush sitting in the bathroom has such a bright blue light that in the middle of the night it glows around the corner and comes into my room. And look, test this out. You know, wake up at three o'clock in the morning when your eyes pupils are wide open and it looks like it's you can read in there from a blue light it's all blue it's all blue you close your eyelids 
and you say, oh, I can't see it. No, blue light goes right through your eyelids, even though you don't consciously think you can see it. You close your eyes, it looks black. No, it goes right to your retina. It triggers the chemicals that kill melatonin. You can't sleep. So listen, one little blue light by itself is not important. In fact, several blue lights by themselves are not important. But couple that with all the other issues you've got in your life and the stress and not eating correctly. Look, take care of all of them. Just follow that advice. Tape over those blue lights. Do something. Close the door or whatever. Get away from the blue lights. Stop looking at the computer and your, and your iPhone and your television. All the, if you possibly can, two hours before you actually want to go to sleep. You, like me, I go to sleep at midnight every night. I, I try to shut down about 10 o'clock. And even if I have to get on the phone, I don't stare at the screen, you know. And so try to avoid that. Yes, yes, I know. You say, well, I can't do it. My life's too busy. I want to watch a movie. We have a dinner at six, you know, I put the kids away. We watch a movie at eight or nine and we're watching the TV at 10. And then I got to catch up on message. OK, I get it. Do it or not, it's up to you. I'm just telling you physiologically what you should do. And if you say these other things are more important to me than a good night's sleep, hey, go at it. I'm just going to lay out the basics. And that is one of the main things I want to talk to you uh, tonight. I want to follow up on the diet, and I want to talk to you about personal habits. Humans are very interesting creatures. We want routines. We like routines. We've always, as far as we can study back in human history, they were about routine. Even back in the hunting gathering, we have pictures of the, of the family waking up in the morning and uh, eating, preparing to go out and hunt. And they went out and stopped game. They stopped in the middle of the day, took a nap. They stalked more. They came back. They stared the game. They cooked over the fire. They ate, they told stories to each other for entertainment, and they went to sleep. After about four or five hours, they woke up, relit the fire. You know, they always had a little fire going, sat around, did a few things, and might even, you know, mend their clothes and stuff, and go back to bed, and then wake up at sunrise. I told you last week that it's not quite normal to have an eight-hour sleep cycle. We think that naturally humans should probably have about eight to ten hours sleep and it's not all at one time. They're geared to go with the sun. And remember, we all originated at one time near the equator. And so that's more or less 12 hours. It's like 10 hours is a short day and 14 hours is a long day. We went to bed with the sun and uh, even that fire campfire going, that's not blue light. There's no blue light in there. There's no nanometer. All of that stuff's up in five and 600 nanometers of wavelengths. There's no blue light in there, no white light. And you can sleep in front of them. That's why, don't you know how you look at a fire and it just puts you to sleep? Man, this is really what's going on here. And we did, didn't even have all these electronic things hundreds of years ago. Fire will put you to sleep. Got the wavelength that promotes it. So uh, break your sleep up if you want. Try to uh, get up and when the sun rises, go out and get a good shock of blue light. You know, personally here, I do I admit, Jackie, I've got it pretty good. I open up the door and I walk out onto the beach and it's a bright light. And man, it just lifts my spirit. And I, in just a couple of minutes, I, even if I was groggy, I'm ready to go. And that's when I do a little personal time, personal development, and we'll talk about that next week. Take a little jog on the beach and then, then come back and eat and work all the day, you know, and that, and then, but you know, actually about 12, two o'clock, we were actually programmed to take a little nap. When we were hunter gatherers, we'd go out and sleep in the shade or the heat of the day, take a rest. And a lot of places in the world, you know, Mexico, Spain, places like that, they still take a siesta because it's so blamed hot. But it actually was tied to the concept that we need to go to bed when it gets dark and take a break of sleeping, wake up in the middle of the night, go to bed again, wake up again, and then also take a nap in the middle of the afternoon, maybe three or four sleep periods a day. 
that's normal. Now, maybe you can't work that into your lifestyle. Do what you can, though. You can change some of it. I know you can. I have. I have. The diet part comes back in. I want to touch on this time, on this uh, week, because not only are there uh, foods that you should eat to uh, produce serotonin and then ultimately melatonin, there's a lot of foods that you should absolutely avoid. And timing of eating is critical also. So let's talk about the ones you should avoid. If you are trying to have good sleep, number one, processed foods. Now, I don't mean just cooked foods, but processed, like there's all kind of nitrous amines in the food. The, the worst offenders are like uh, cured sausages. Uh, they have a nitrous oxide compounds in there to keep them from spoiling. Uh, pink salt is another one. Any of these preservatives, sodium benzoate, uh, that's on almost all grapes, they absolutely <clears throat> will stimulate your uh, hypothalamus to produce uh, epinephrine, which is the chemical that excites you. It's the one that says, hey, run, fight, do something. And it just starts dribbling that chemical into your bloodstream. Uh, this is a totally artificial ingredient, does not appear anywhere in nature, uh, and yet we consume it because long-term effects, uh, they don't count whether you can sleep or not. They count whether you people die or get sick. They don't count, well, I didn't sleep. And anyhow, you have to, this might take 10, 20 years for this to develop over your life, but if you continually take in these processed foods, Hey, you know what? I'm sorry. I love it too. Bologna, hot dogs. Oh my goodness. I eat that all the time, even as a midnight snack. Okay. I don't do it myself, but these things have a lot of these chemicals in it. So any preservative, sodium benzate is another really big bad boy. Uh, it, it'll, it's what they put inside water to purify water. And it's on almost all grapes and in grape juice and in wines. And so, and sulfites are another one. Speaking of wines, you know, you take a little wine and it can calm you down, but it's also got some things in that are not so great. So avoid processed foods if you want a good night's sleep. Number two, absolutely avoid processed sugars, refined sugars. Now that's for a whole different reason. You've heard me talk about how that can lead into inflammation. It can lead to diabetes. It can lead to your body's on a constant chronic inflammation, but also taking in refined sugars. What are they? Table sugar? Yeah. But also bread, refined white bread. That's another good uh, an example. Remember, look at on our sites and see what is a re refined sugar or not. You take this stuff and it's just like a drug. It lights up your brain just like heroin and cocaine. Now, if you want to be on heroin or cocaine, that is fine. But I'll tell you what, that stuff will not help you sleep. And refined sugar is an uh, enemy to good sleep. If you are going to take some of these chemicals, take them further in the day, at least lunch or something. You know, that's a good time to have a hot dog. Have them at lunch. Let your body get rid of them. But it's best if you don't have any of these things. So don't do not take refined sugars. Do not take processed chemicals. Here's one that's going to really... Uh, surprise a lot of people citrus products any citrus products and mangoes and pineapple because they have natural stimulants in them very similar to epinephrine and uh, in fact in some countries certain citrus species are banned such as the spanish or Seville sour orange you're not a, you can eat one naturally but you cannot take it as a supplement because they see it as a stimulant Synephrine is the name of it. Epinephrine, synephrine, very similar basic uh, chemical backbone. Boy, it will light your brain up. And you can take a glass of orange juice and think, wow, this is so healthy. It'll keep you awake all night. So, you know, you've heard about it. Well, I want a glass of milk before going to bed. It actually does have the chemicals in there that promote that melatonin. Things like orange juice. Uh, complete opposite. So those are really, I would say, uh, 
you know, you can actually Google these things and go on the net. I'm not going to give you a list of the 20 products. What I'm saying here is pay attention to what you eat. There are plenty of foods that are stimulants and you want to stay away from those. All right. When should you eat? When should you eat? Well, most people uh, start digesting, you know, immediately. And then uh, about two hours, they're in the full-blown digestion. And by four hours, their gut is emptied. And then, you know, usually it's, uh, if you're normal, you get a good 24-hour cycle until it enters into the lower, uh, small intestine and then into the colon. All kinds of things are happening at each stage there. But in particular, where as soon as you get out of the stomach, the stomach is the one generally where all the big chemical reactions take place the, and uh, the, the major breakdowns occur and massive release of, of food and your body, uh, it's, it's so strange, it's distracted from sleeping during that time. You need to wait until the food is into the small intestine where the uh, diffusion of the molecules across that barrier are slower, much less rapid. It's a much more calm reaction. And these are glucose transporter two for anybody who wants to know that stuff, glucose transporter five and a little bit of glucose transporter four. It's slow in general in the small intestine, but in the stomach, boy, you dump the acid in there. You, you can actually dissolve some metals with that stomach acid, and that absolutely will keep you awake. So if you go to bed with a full stomach, uh, it's going to totally put off your sleep until another two or three hours, and then you're going to be messed up. Your whole cycle will be off. You're trying to hit that serotonin the melatonin switch, what happens around 10 p.m. into 2 a.m. And if you eat too late, your whole system is going to be set, whacked up. Now, you say, oh, that doesn't happen to me. <clears throat> yes, I get it. You know, that's true. Every single person is different. I've got to give you here the general guidelines. Everybody is different. My own mother drank coffee. If she was awake, she'd drink a cup of coffee every hour. She could go to bed at 1 a.m. with a cup of coffee and bam, she's asleep in a half an hour. I don't know how she does that. Her body is just not sensitive to caffeine. And everyone will tell me, oh, I love to go to sleep uh, right after a meal. In fact, I get lazy. Well, that's actually true. You do get lazy after a big meal it's because the blood flow is taken away from your brain and goes to your stomach just like those processes i just told you about and that sucks the energy and oxygen away from your brain and you feel sleepy but that is not sleep that's a totally different sensation so i'm talking about if you want to get a good sleep do not eat right before bed at least two hours you know Personally, I eat at 8 p.m. It's my favorite spot, 7.30 to 8. I go to bed at 12. And th that's what I try to work on. So, Jackie, what are we doing on the time here? I've just got one more tough subject to cover. Uh, you've got enough time, Dr. Ahrens. You're doing well. Okay, so I want to talk to you about the personal habits that I just alluded to. Uh, where we went, the hunter-gatherers went out in this routine and they... Uh, we're prepared to do every single day. And the brain sets up like that and it expects things. It actually expects, and many tests have been done, not only with humans, but with animals, mammals, rats and mice, etc., chickens. And that <clears throat> if you give them a routine and their body prepares for it, let's say you, you know, the Pavlov experiment, you know, you might know, not know that one, but let's say you eat every day at six o'clock. And you, and, and at five o'clock, you know, you start cleaning up and you get ready for the meal or you start cooking the meal. And they have found out by people, for instance, going in there to, to do that habit, cleaning up, washing up or preparing the meal at five, it starts chemical processes because your brain knows it's going to eat at six o'clock and you don't even think about it. And if you miss it, man, you can get all whacked out. You know how you, that's all happened to plenty of you. You thought, you know, it's not, it is not just 
well, I usually eat at seven and now it's eight, so I'm hungry. No, 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 that's really not it. It's because when you, at seven o'clock, your body started dumping all these chemicals, anticipating what was going to happen. And that is just how it is with sleep. You need to develop a routine, not only get up in the morning, like I told you, and get the sunshine. That is just a physical thing to do, but the habit of doing it at a certain time every day trains your body. You go through the day, you get tired, and you go to bed at a certain time. You do certain actions, whatever they might be. You take a bath, you take a shower or whatever. You brush your teeth, you turn down the bed, you turn on the music, you set the air conditioner. What Those things that you do every time, it tells your body it's time to sleep. That I'm really being serious here. Your body actually starts that melatonin process more deeply. It picks up on its own clues that you trained it to do. And if you don't not have a regular habit, you can't sleep very well. A lot of people, it's been shown that travel a lot and they're in different hotels and different places. They got meetings and they say they can't sleep. And they always say, well, you know, I'm in a different hotel and I'm in bad bed. I just can't sleep. The reason is a routine went to hell. That's really what has happened. And their body, the chemicals start being produced. And instead, you know, trying to get you to go to bed and be in bed at nine and 10, or you've got a dinner meeting, you're out, you know, all of us have suffered this. And then you've got to go see people after that. You got cocktails and it's 10 or 11 before you can get to bed. It's not just that you're tired or you're too alert from all the conversation, which is always possible. It's your routine. Your chemicals now just do not match what your body expects. So do the same thing every time. Have a habit. My habit in the bedroom starts when I get up. I make my bed. That's a well-known habit that helps you sleep. How in the world is, does that do that? Well, it's not just sleep, but if you make your bed and you get up, it first thing it does is it primes you. Your, your, your brain wants that. This is what I do when I get up. I make my bed. It's a good habit. It's a sense of accomplishment. Instead of starting out the day sloppy, have a little discipline. Put, make your bed, put your pajamas, pick them up off the floor, put them in the dirty clothes or whatever you do with them. Have a routine. And then when you come back at night and you are ready to go to bed, when you walk in and see that bed made, it actually sends a signal to your brain saying, okay, it's time to unmake that bed. <laughs> that really happens. You see a well-made bed, you can see it's a signal. Now, if you never uh, have make your bed and you see the bed, it doesn't mean anything to your brain. Okay, it's just a bed, it's never made, it doesn't mean anything. You never see it made. But you go into your room at night and you see the bed is made. It's a sense of accomplishment. It's inviting. You pull down the cover. Okay, that pull down. Look, guys, I know this little stuff, this tr sounds trivial. It's not. Pulling down the covers, flopping the pillow, it sends a signal. It's telling your brain serotonin to melatonin, serotonin to melatonin. Have a habit like that. I hope, hope that you will also have the habit of then turn off the television. Another thing, don't go in your bedroom unless you absolutely can avoid, cannot avoid it. Don't go in the bedroom unless you're ready to sleep. <clears throat> ready to sleep. Make that place a place to sleep or take a nap. If you, some people I know, like I used to have my office right in my bedroom and my brain could not figure out, well, are we coming in here to work or are we coming in here to sleep? That was actually quite important. I got my office out of my bedroom I noticed a change because now when I go into my bedroom, the bed is there. It's neat. I'm here. My brain, I'm here. You're here to sleep. You're not here to work. Pull down those covers. It actually does chemical signaling to your brain. All right. I want to close with one thing. What else <laughs> do you do in the bedroom? I don't know. Or else might be for some of you on the kitchen table, but it's sex. Okay. You know, and I've been asked a lot about that. Well, gosh, you know, sex, uh, it's real exhilarating. It pumps my heart up. And uh, I, are, should I be having sex at night? Because it looks like it's Dr. Aaron's, it's completely opposite of everything you've said. 
And uh, well, no, it's actually not because if you uh, know the chemistry, because yes, you get adrenaline, you you know your di eyes dilate, your heartbeat goes up, and uh, but overwhelmingly, afterwards, the chemicals that are released into your brain are to sleep. Now, there's biological reasons for that biological reasons it's actually biological mating once you mate you don't want to then run around you actually especially in the case of females it was to procreate and the best thing to do after having intercourse would be to rest and you know get pregnant and so that is you're not that doesn't do well by you just running around so that's part of it it actually releases chemicals that says okay you had a great time the dopamine was out there, but now rest. And boy, the tension can melt off of you. And so I always say to people to ask me, hey, you know what? Do all these things I said. And be sure you have sex at least, you know, once a night right at 10 p.m. after the kids are in bed. So, you know, that reminds me um, about this woman and man who went into the doctor. And the guy is just, in, you know, he's on death's door. And. Uh, he, they have a conference and so uh, the doctor says look I want to tell the wife you something in private you know because I don't want to depress him so he the, the patient the man he waits outside and the woman goes into the doctor's office and she's okay what is it the bad news he said well it's not too bad news uh, he could recover because of the chemistry involved in sex if you just have sex with him once a night he can recover and so she goes back outside and, and the man says well what did the doctor say she said you're gonna die <laughs> so with that i'm you're very welcome <laughs> dr aaron so you know for us women that like to fluff up the pillows on the bed and you know and for husbands that go why do you need all of those pillows on the bed well we the pillows up because we're preparing to go to bed and of course yes sex is one of those things that um i didn't think we were going to dive into but we certainly dived in deep didn't we everybody so uh, but the big important thing that dr Ernst and i got out of this i mean there were so many key um, points there to the importance of sleep but the big thing being is that the routine that we actually put in place from the time we wake up going throughout the day the type of foods that we eat the timing of the last meal that we should have, and then just having that routine. So I hope everybody has enjoyed this call as much as um, I have. Um, I must admit, towards the end there, I just went, oh, okay, where are we heading with this? Um, but it's always nice to be real, and that's what I love about Dr. Aarons. He always brings a real um, approach and a part of him to these calls so we thank each and every one of you and we're very grateful that you actually take the time out to join us and we look forward to seeing you next week so thank you so much dr aarons bye bye thank, thank you, you.